Please welcome Dr. Michael Ramsey. And now we come to our first panel discussion. Um, and it's one of two that are kind of on the same topic, looking at how different healthcare systems have uh, approached patient safety and been able to develop a culture of safety in their institution with great results. So um, this title is called The Role of the Board and C-Suite in Fostering a Culture of Safety. And uh, please welcome our panel. And uh, Joe Kiani is going to moderate the panel. Thank you, Joe. Please welcome Joe Kiani, Kimberly Kreib, Marcus Schaubecker, Tom Jakowitz, and Chad Lefteris. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Maybe uh, I'll sit, sit over here. What an incredible panel we have today. Thank you all. I'm going to first introduce you all, and then we'll go through the questions and answers, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, so uh, Kimberly, Kimberly Kreip is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Children's Hospital of Orange County. Uh, Kim has been at the helm of CHOC since 1997, and during her tenure, CHOC has advanced from a regional children's hospital to a nationally recognized pediatric healthcare system with two hospital locations, five centers of excellence, two pediatric trauma centers, a pediatric mental health system of care, and more than 35 primary and specialty care centers. And I can tell you, because I serve on the board of Children's Hospital of Orange County, Kim has been an advocate for patient safety. Uh, and I can't wait to hear from you how you've done it, but one of the best patient safety records I, I'm aware of. Um, Dr. Marcus uh, Schaubecker, um, ECI, who is CEO of ECRI. ECRI is a global nonprofit that has worked for more than 60 years to improve the quality and safety of healthcare. Their insights span nearly every facet of the delivery of care, from clinical best practice to breakthrough treatments to workforce culture and safe medical technologies. Uh, they've been evaluating the safety of medical devices longer than the FDA and operate the world's only unbiased testing labs. ECRI is also the only organization that's both a PSO and an evidence-based practice center. Dr. Schaubacher has spent more than 35 years in the healthcare industry, including as an anesthesiologist and intensive care specialist in Germany and South Africa. And uh, he held senior leadership roles in the medical device and pharmaceutical industries. Since 2018, uh, Dr. Schaubacher has led ECRI to become a global leader in patient safety, medical technology, and health equity issues. Thank you for being here. Um, Tom uh, Jakowicz. It's pretty close. Close. How do you pronounce your last uh, name? Jakowicz. Jakowicz. Pleasure. Pleasure to have you. Tom is president of the University of Chicago Health Systems, the $5 billion, seven hospital clinical enterprise that integrates the patient care mission of the health system with the education and research missions of the University of Chicago. Tom is highly regarded for his ability to reimagine how the traditional academic health system chassis can better support the clinical, educational, and research needs of the future and accelerate delivery of research-driven practices to inpatient, outpatient, and home settings. Tom, prior to joining U Chicago of Medicine, served as CEO of Keck Medicine of USC, right here in our backyard, where he grew the medical enterprise from a $450 million to a $2.2 billion regional academic health system and achieved the top 20 ranking on the U.S. News and World Report Best Hospitals Honor Roll. Thanks for being here. Chad Leftris, who I have to thank for saving my life. <laughs> thank you for being here. Uh, Chad is the president and CEO of UCI Health, Orange County's only academic health system. Uh, Chad oversees all clinical and patient care operations, including UCI Medical Center in Orange, consistently recognized among America's best hospitals by US News and World Report. Uh, Leftris also serves as UCI Health Community Network with compromises for community hospitals and throughout Orange County and Southeast Los Angeles County. UCI Health consists of over 1,300 licensed beds, 1,200 caregivers who provide more than 1.4 million patient encounters at over 40 locations. 
thank you so much for being with us, Chad. Thank you. Thank you. So first, I'll start off with you, Kim. Um, how do you foster this culture of uh, patient safety? How did you get to zero six years in a row? Uh, please, please tell, tell everybody the things you've done to, to get chalk there. I'm well, happy to, Joe, and thank you for including me this morning. It's good to be here with everybody. You know, um, I, I think we all know how important leadership's commitment is to patient safety and quality. I mean, that's just absolutely at the start of it. But as time has progressed, I think I'd expand that to say a commitment to patient safety and quality by establishing a culture of collaboration and open communication. And we've already heard this morning a couple of examples of how important it is um, to involve our whole workforce in, in what we're doing. So for us, um, it's, you know, it's what do the leaders do? How, do? how do we show up? How visible are we? What are we talking about in the boardroom? And I have to thank you, Joe, for really helping us as a, as a board um, understand the importance of the role of the board in the C-suite and in, in advancing that. So, um, you know, the obvious things, rounding, attend, attending, you know, patient safety huddles, all of those things. I call them obvious, but I, I say that because we've been talking about it for a number of years. They're, they may not be so obvious to, to every healthcare system. But post-COVID, one thing we've really discovered is some of the harm, and you, you talked about the recovery of, of post-COVID, we all learned to operate in a virtual world, and we're really finding one of the things right now that's so important is getting back together and being with one another. It's hard to collaborate. You can do it um, in a virtual setting, but you know, on campus, in person, those kinds of things. Um, and then the last thing I would add, and, and you mentioned it, um, we have a system within our healthcare system of setting organizational priorities and quality and patient safety have been um, at, at, at the top of that list. So every manager in our organization has a set, we all march to the same set of um, organizational goals and, and uh, zero uh, preventable deaths, as you know, Joe, has been one of those. But we're finding, and, and we all learn this, that what we talk about, what we measure, you know, we actually can move the needle, but it's really, really true. Um, and you can never, never stop. You mentioned we were fortunate to go for a long period of time with zero preventable deaths, but last year we had one. And it's absolutely devastating. And hearing Lewis's story, we, we all, I think we all know how devastating it is. So I think there are a number of strategies that are important to think about at, at the C-suite and board level. Thank you. you. You do have an incredible culture and this whole collaboration. I know it's been hard with, uh, with COVID, but uh, that patient-centered, patient-focus, it's incredible how it is on the minds of everybody from yourself to the nursing to the doctors. Can you just share with this team, what have you done to create that, that collaborative and patient-centered uh, perspective? It's, um... It's hard to really point to one thing. There are so many different channels, so many different strategies. Those of us that are in large health systems, academic health systems, the cultures are really different. Um, and we are in an, organ, uh, an industry that's highly regulate, regulated. There's a lot of hierarchy. So breaking down those walls is just, you have to be mindful and vigilant at the same time. So sometimes I think maybe as a children's hospital, we have a slight leg up because we really do depend on the families. I mean, it's hard to have a two-year-old tell you exactly what's going on. So part of how we care for the patient is to engage the family. But even that, it's hard to get, depending on some of its gender related, some of its cultural related, some of its age related, to get whatever, your highly trained staff to listen to everyone on the team. So we spend a lot of time trying to work on inclusion, trying to have, you know, team meetings, and um, we're moving into kind of a space of, of proactive safety. I think we're all thinking about that, not being so reactive, but how we bring people together who can see where the problems are before they become problems. So it's Honestly, it's, we're just always trying new pilots and new things. Some of them work really well, some of them not so well, but 
getting our staff comfortable telling somebody who's supposed to be at the top, whether it's the CEO or the head surgeon or whatever the case may be, it's okay to question that person, I think is honestly the most important thing we're doing and then making sure it really is okay. So that'll go to psychological safety, which I bet my colleagues are gonna talk about as well. Thank you, thank you so much, Kim. That's, that's very helpful. Um, you are looking at this from not just medical background that you have, but as engineers, how do you think healthcare systems can redesign uh, their whole, maybe the hospital, maybe how they do things to reduce medical errors dramatically. John, thank you for, for having us. And yes, we, we're looking at this from a really different, uh, in a really different way. We call it the total system safety approach, which by the way is not, we, we didn't invent this, right? So this is a philosophy, a methodology which has been used in other high risk industries like aviation, uh, military, nuclear power. And it systemizes a lot what Kim talked about. It systemizes leadership. It systemizes including the patient and their caregivers, their families. It has, uh, it's asking for an agile learning system where you share your successes and re-amplify those successes so that people can apply it across the board. And where you, um, Talk about your misses and your near misses, because that's the opportunity to prevent in the future. And we are very much about moving the needle forward. What we have done since To Air as Human is focusing on analyzing what happened after. What we are all about talking about now is moving it forward and saying, how can we prevent harm? And we need to, we need to include um, a, human fa a clinically informed human factor engineering aspect in looking at the system because the eventual failure is never an individual's fault. There has been a series of events leading up to that catastrophic moment, but it's not that person's fault. It's the failure in the system along the way because the system was not designed the right way. There's a saying, the, the system gets you the results it's designed for. If you turn that on its head, it also means if you get failure, your system is wrong. Design. And we have tried to work the system over and over and again. That's the definition of insanity, right? You're doing things over and over again and expect different outcome. And the last aspect, which is so, so important, is that cultural aspect, the creating, and, and I think that's the board's and the C-suite's responsibility to create and work environment where everyone is equal, right? Where everybody is safe, emotionally safe, psychological safe to speak up. I always say the janitor and the person who takes the person from one appointment to another is more important than maybe the physician because they see that patient every day. They see there might be a different pill on that tray. Medication uh, errors are the number one leading cause of preventable harm, more than 30% of the events. The, the parent, the mother, the father, um, the partner of a patient, they see if something is different. We saw it in the video. The mom saw that her son was not well and she was just ignored. And, and so that's where we're saying that this, this is why we need to take a systematic approach. We need to do things different. Marcus, ACRI has such an incredible outreach throughout the world of practically every hospital. Do you have hospitals that are following your direction on redesigning the hospital system? Yeah, we, we're starting to see some successes, right? We're starting to see people who truly apply that. And it's not, it, people always ask me, wow, that's, you know, how can we change the entire system? You don't have to. You start somewhere where either you have the biggest problem um, or you have a team which is really engaged and for example, we worked with a, with a large hospital system in Philadelphia and they had um, an out of the norm mortality in their ICU due to sepsis. So we brought in our human factor engineers, we worked with their folks and we dissected the entire process of how they're dealing with sept, sec, uh, sepsis. We did you know, flow charts on the board and then we redesigned with human factor engineering in mind they had a um, 
dramatic reduction in mortality, 90% reduction in mortality in six months, and we saved millions of dollars at the same time. So we did that in one ICU, they now use that same methodology and rolled it out to, to their peripheral hospitals, where it's even more important. Right? Wow. And, and that's just one single um, example on how you can go about it. So you don't need to fix everything at once. The other argument I'm often getting is, we don't have the resource and it's too expensive to do that. We're spending way more resources, time and money <laughs> and people fixing the problems we creating um, and, and then if you would be proactive about it. And, and the other thing which gets to me is as a physician, as a clinician, you swear an oath, do no harm. And we, I'm sorry to say it, we killing people every single day in our care and nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to care. The complacency is just gets to me. And I, you know, I'm thanking you and Many people in the room here have been working on this tirely. You mentioned the meeting in the White House. We'll, we'll be there, right? And, and I think first time an administration has made it at least an agenda item, yes. right? Um, so now, but we need to move it. We, we, we got to stop saying it's okay. We got to stop saying it's okay. It's not. Thank you. Thank you so much. Marcus, um, you mentioned the IHI to Ares Human Report. I think the lead author, is Dr. Don Berwick, is here with us. And, and you're right, even that report was saying, we got to fix the system. So, Tom, <laughs> you've got a big system. <laughs> you're in <a laughs> Chicago. Um, what have you implemented? What have you changed that has worked fixing the system? Yeah, no, it's, it's one of the things, I, I want to go double back on something Kim said, because I think it's really important, is this overall culture of safety is critical. Right, you've got to continue to reinforce in the leadership about what what really matters. And it goes back to your point, Marcus. And I think the other part about healthcare at the moment has been we've seen a lot of turnover, especially in inpatient nursing. We we have people there, but they're a lot younger than they used to be and a lot less experienced. So I think our training and our really reinforcing the systems. I think the one thing I would point out, and now there's a lot of different things we we've got. Number one, we've we've used we've the clinical EMR, I think for the first time in 20 years, is much more, I think it's a lot stronger tool than it's ever been. And, and I feel like the data that we can get out of, the, out of the EMR is a lot stronger. So we've actually developed a lot of algorithms around safety about, let's point out as, as patients are deteriorating and, and trying to leverage all those sort of tools so that we prevent the errors. We have a less experienced workforce so what can we do? So I would say we've, um, we've leveraged the EMR. We've also used a lot more remote monitoring. And you know, part of it is where we are in Hyde Park. We, we sit in a very unique area. For people who don't know Chicago, so we're on the south side of Chicago. When people talk about that 30-year age discrepancy between the Gulf Coast of downtown and the neighborhoods of Woodlawn, that's us. That, that neighborhood's two miles from us. So I feel very empowered about what we can do with our community and how do we empower them. Now, I'd also like to say that 60% of our patients are patients of color and 60% of our workforce are patients of colors. So we're, we are deeply embedded in our neighborhood and, and we've decided, you know, using the EMR and the remote monitoring to track our patients. You know, I, I think the technology divide, there is some truth to it, but it's not as, as wide as you think it is. People have smartphones, people are connected, and we're working really closely with our folks in our neighborhood to try to get out, get out of our hospital and think about the patient holistically, because we realize when a patient comes to our emergency room and they're really very sick, that it's, it's some, I don't wanna say it's too late, but a lot of times things have advanced so far that it, we bring a lot of, we bring a lot of like, let's say resources to that patient. But the reality of it is because of the lack of care on the south side, that patient progressed a lot farther than they would have if they were on the north side of Chicago. So I would say, number one is we're leveraging the EMR, we're doubling down on our culture of safety, and number two is we're really with remote monitoring and in trying to really track our patients so that we're trying to sort of get our arms around the whole patient. Wow. So you're using the electronic medical record as a clinical tool uh, where you're catching, I think, issues, uh, alerting you about issues? How's well, that being used? Yeah, so exactly right. So we're actually developing algorithms in the organization so that we can track patients. So if a patient starts to deteriorate, very early warning, uh, and, and, it's been, and it's been really effective in terms of like notifying us, because of course we're getting a lot of patients 
coming through the emergency room who are very sick. And a lot of times it's the first time we've seen that patient and we want to make sure that these patients have a very safe outcome when we get them back home. Uh, it, it's, but it, it's one of those where I think it's a real moment of development, a health system. We used a lot of administrative data sets before to measure quality. Those days are done. We've got the clinical data. We can measure it in real time. Let's use that data. Let's begin to benchmark. You know, one of the, our big EMR system now is actually creating databases where we can benchmark their clinical data, our clinical data against everybody who's using their system. That is going to be a very powerful tool in the long run to make sure our patients are getting the best care. And going to Marcus's point, how do we know our system at the University of Chicago is as good as you know, fill in the blank and making sure we're providing the best care for our patients? Great. And just for the group here, the remote monitoring, is that something you sent the patient home with? How do you use remote well, monitoring? Well, yeah, we actually do send the patient. And I'll, we, we did a program in OB with hypertension, right, which was a real problem with maternal, uh, you know, mortality and morbidity. So we have started a remote, pro remote monitoring program with all of our patients, any, anybody who's at risk for hypertension. So all of our OB program patients are actually getting remote monitored for hypertension. Nice. Is Dr. Yeah. Diane still here? Yeah, it's, it's how the California you, it's initiative. How to, <laughs> well, you know, the other thing I'll say, and I know there's a lot of people here from Europe, and my wife is British. There's a lot of really good ideas in Europe. Yeah. We should take those, <laughs> yeah. right? Because some of these problems have already been solved. I think sometimes in the U.S. we have to think we have to invent everything. That's not true. We should look around the world more for good solutions. That's why we gather here. We want to learn from each other. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Chad. I experienced firsthand what I think is the best healthcare I wish everybody would get when I had my incident. And one of the things I observed is the respect uh, the doctors gave to the nurses and nurses gave to the doctors and how collaborative they were. And by the way, they all wanted to tell me, Joe, you're not getting special care. This is the same care everybody else gets. So I don't know if you told them to tell me that, but they all told me that. That was not part of the script. That was not part of the script. Okay. Well, that's really good to hear. So how did you do that? How do you get this collaboration? How do you get this respect? Um, what did you do? Uh, I think, first of all, thank you. And, and order matters. I can't, to go last in, in this uh, incredible colleagues here. I, I would say that it really does go back to this theme around culture that you're already hearing. And... I'm not sure you thought this would turn into a whole cultural dis debate, but I actually believe that if you're not proactively working culture in your organization, in your team, in your whatever, it could be working against you. It, and likely it is. And so we've tried to take a very proactive approach to that. That culture is not something that has to do with rainbows and unicorns. Right? This is measurable force that drives results, and this is what we're talking about, right? the results of improving the overall safety and quality. And so we spend a lot of time on that, talking about that, you know, sort of inspect what you expect, right, is what you're saying. And so we spend a lot of time understanding, creating a safe place for people to ask questions, raise those concerns. If I may tell one quick story, I have a dear friend and mentor who's unfortunately received a horrible terminal diagnosis back east. I went to visit him. He was in for a uh, hospital, a great facility for 11 days. And he told me the story of an environmental services worker that came in that was having a very bad day. And he could tell. So he started talking to the environmental services worker and they were really down. And it was this concept of, well, I'm just a janitor. What do I know? What do I? Well, this, my dear friend, uh, who's been in health systems for 35 years, took the time to educate him about do you see what you're doing and how you're cleaning and disinfecting and how you're protecting me and you're protecting my family? Next thing you know, that EVS worker not only lit up, brought in other colleagues throughout the rest of his stay to say, you need to hear this from this patient. Brought in his manager. <laughs> Imagine great. the manager, right? Brought in the manager. You need to hear this from yeah. this patient, right? So there was a failure there that they haven't communicated, connected the dots, which is something that we spend a ton of time on. We're not perfect on that but connecting the dots for it doesn't matter where you sit. You could be the cook in the kitchen, the amazing surgeon, you name it. Everyone in between that has to be able to connect back to exactly what you experienced. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I, I as an engineer, you know, it's hard for me to believe, uh, I'm about to say this, but uh, I don't think anything happens by accident. So this whole Big Bang Theory, shoot me. <laughs> it's hard for me to believe it. It takes discipline. It takes 
uh, repeated effort to get what you want. So it sounds like you're repeating, re repeating the lessons to your clinicians. But I want to ask you all, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> so we're not going to go last. Um, what's, what is the board of directors that you report to, that you go to? What is their knowledge about patient safety issues? And how do they get involved? And what can you, I'm going to come to all of you and ask you this question. What because you guys are all exemplary, what can they do to help drive the patient safety goals home? But first, what, what do you guys do? Yeah, thank you. At University of California, Irvine, as a part of University of California, we have a statewide board, which as you can imagine, think about, you think about the discrepancies across Chicago, you know that, think about the whole state of California, Dr. Ramos, we all know that. So what a unique board and what a unique opportunity. And so fortunately, we have a dedicated health, if you will, committee of the board. Um, and that is absolutely their focus. And which, are they experts in it, Joe? No, no, no. Actually, maybe only one or two have even passed through that. So our job as, as the CEOs and health system leaders across the University of California is to bring them on this journey with us and help set very audacious goals. Because ultimately it's about improving the health of Californians. That's where we start, that's where we finish. Um, and our board, I think, is hyper engaged in that and then we work with them to educate them, train in many ways, how they can help influence that, impact that with us. And I think that's the treadmill we never get off of as leaders yeah. at C-Suites. Educate management. the board and have the board push for what Correct. you've educated them on. Tom, you wanna? Yeah, no, I, I, well, because we are a private hospital system, we have a quality, we have a quality board. And I, I think it's really important. A couple things with a board, I said, I wanna ask, you have to ask us tough questions because we are never gonna be good enough. And I think, and really empowering your board members to ask those questions. Now we spend a lot of time educating them about and talking through and spending, you know, when we get together as a board, spending time, what are really the key things you need to be looking at and what are the questions you need to ask us? And I realize my job is to empower that board with our team to make sure that they push us hard on this because there is nothing more important than patient safety. And, and I think our board does a really good job. They, they will make us uncomfortable and they'll question us about the things that happened that shouldn't have happened. And that's exactly what you need. But it takes, it takes time because people coming in, they'll ask the questions that they'll read about in the media or whatever, but that's not the hardest questions. And I think that's the part that I, I really like the fact when our board asks a question and our, and our quality leaders don't know what to say because I know that, okay, now we're at that depth that they need to be at because it's, it's really this, there is nothing more important than this. Right. And I think a lot of board members come in and they're usually pretty astute financially and they can ask tough financial questions. And I say, your quality questions need to be harder than those financial questions. And I think that takes, but it takes a while. It also takes board members who are really dedicated to that committee and are on that committee for a long time. So we have a lot of folks who have been on the committee for 20 years and they've seen our progress and they continue to ask the really tough questions. Well, after a couple of major public company collapses, they came up with Sarbanes-Oxley where they want a financial expert on the board, typically ex-CFO. Maybe it's time we demand an ex-patient safety officer on every board. That's probably uh, a pretty good idea. Uh, Kim, tell us about your board and uh, I know a little bit about it, but I'm gonna pretend I don't. How do you do it? How, what is the role of your board on patient safety and? Uh, what do you I, recommend? I think my, my colleagues have brought up a couple things. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I, it, I'm in a nonprofit organization and it's a fiduciary board. And so when we ask people, you know, who wants to sit on the finance committee? We had a lot of volunteers for the <laughs> finance committee and we do have a board quality committee. And it, it, it's, it's just, it, to me, it's absolutely fascinating because most of our board members aren't clinicians. They're not practice, you know, licensed to practice medicine. So they have to trust others and they delegate a lot of those responsibilities to the medical staff so there's this interesting dynamic when it comes to how do they fulfill their responsibility to the community and patient safety and quality is job number one so I, I agree with Tom I think being very purposeful about who you select 
to serve on your quality committee. I'm looking at a man that was a great quality committee chair. <laughs> People who aren't afraid to ask those hard questions. It's hard to ask those questions. You've got, you know, a renowned whatever, surgeon or this or that, and it does go back to the system. So I, I think thinking about who you want on that committee, and it shouldn't be an easy, comfortable committee, and it's not. I do love those <laughs> moments where there's a question and everyone's like, uh, <laughs> uh, let me get back to you on that. There's some work to be done. So. Um, it's a, an extremely important component of our governance, but it's hard to get the right people in the right place and get that balance. So, um, and, and you, <laughs> Joe was never afraid to ask those questions and we're a much better organization because of the way you pushed us, but I'll also say in a very respectful way. So you can push hard and then you start to undermine collaboration in your culture. So it needs to be done in a respectful way where people aren't afraid of, you know, what, what the consequences might be. So it's it's a journey, as That's you know. And, um, you, and, and as CEO, you try to pick people that can serve on that committee for quality, uh, yeah. which which is great. I remember when you came to me and I said, well, you sure you want me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to be driving for zero. I, I'm, I'm leading this thing. I went, That's why I'm, I'm not really you. sure, but no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. In picking people from outside of our industry, you know we've done that too. I mean, we have a way of doing things in healthcare, but we've got someone that came out of aviation and, and that have, have a different perspective and um, perhaps more experience than, than we do as, as healthcare providers. So thank you. Um, Marcus, I guess uh, if you're talking to board members, and a lot of people are here, but a lot of people are watching this thing live, what are the high priority patient safety issues you think boards should be focusing on? Well, number one, they need to think about it. So there was a survey in 22 from the American Hospital Association, um, and I was, I was really surprised when I read the numbers. Those are hospital boards. Only 50% of the hospital boards in 2022 had quality as their number one or two priority, which means half didn't, wow. half didn't. 60% yeah. um, did spend less than 20% of their time on quality and safety. How do you do that? 40% right? um, didn't even have it on each time of their agenda. So, and only 24% had a physician on the board. So apparently financials are important, no, don't, don't get me wrong, but if we wanna get to zero harm, we gotta make it a number one priority. And what gets measured gets done. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. It's, it's you said it, you know, expect the, what you what you can expect and if you don't measure it your leaders are not going to think it's important to you and and therefore i, I got a it's a wake-up call to the boards out there and to the people who are sitting on the boards and saying stop sit back and make it your priority how can how can you and, and i said it before how can we be so complacent i know a lot of people don't like the aviation comparison. I'm still going to do it. <laughs> Aviation came together in early 2000 and said, we're going to have zero harm. Since 2009, there's zero casualties in commercial aviation in the United States. If aviation would act like we do in medicine, they would have a Boeing 737 and an Airbus 320 crash with 100% fatalities every single day. That's our record. That's our record in organizations where we swore an oath to do no harm. Imagine that happens in aviation. Second day that would happen, we shut down everything. Nobody would take off, nobody would fly until we figured it out. Why is that not happening in healthcare? One of the answers is because the boards don't care. I'm sorry to say it that bad, but, or at least they don't show that they care. They might care, but they don't show it, they don't show it to their leaders. And therefore the leaders don't make it their priority. I love those moments too, when my board asks me a question where I don't have an answer, the board does its job. 
it's not about the fancy brochures and the great records and the patient satisfaction scores, all important, don't get me wrong. At the end of the day, if the boards don't hear within three days of there was an, a, a critical incident, they're not doing their job. And CMS is cracking down on it. The statutes go into effect, unfortunately, without T's for now in 2025, but there's pretty clear expectations formulated on what boards should be doing in regards to, um, to patient safety, and I can only encourage the boards out there to please take it serious. I love that, Marcus. Yeah. I've, I, it's like you, I always think there should be no elective surgeries in a hospital unless they have all the evidence-based practices in place. I mean, it's crazy that I know most hospitals don't have them all in place. And, and you're right, what measured, what's measured improves. And, you know, in my day job, I run a medical technology company. And a lot of companies who make things, they can look at financials as a board as a way of knowing how well the company's doing. Because if it's growing, maybe their products are good, maybe they're high quality, maybe you know, they're doing the right things. But with a lot of hospitals who are just community hospitals, they're not getting patients from around the world. By looking at the financials, it doesn't really tell you anything about how the organization is doing, uh, other than is it running out of money or not, I get that. But, but it doesn't which tell is you, which, right, is so. which is important, which is important, which is important, but it's not enough quality patient safety, and even outcomes. I think how well the hospital is doing on the different outcomes, whether it's for cancer, whether it's for hip implants, lung, whatever, whatever they're providing, they should know how they're stacking up against their peers. And if they're not the best hospital in it, they should work to become the best. I, I, I am totally with you on this, and I think it's, it's, it's got to be an agenda for every board meeting patient safety and quality. So, and, and you see that it works, right? So yeah. Kim has, has demonstrated, Chad has yeah. demonstrated, I'm sure you will. And, uh, and that's actually it, it a good works. segue. You three have built incredible, incredibly successful hospitals that are giving really good care, really low medical error rates to none. The one you mentioned, it wasn't even one of the ones we have evidence-based practices for, that medical error that happened a year ago. And kudos to your organization to call and get a medical error where some people think if you're measuring it, you're going to hide it. That, that is not what you guys do. And it could have easily been uh, not considered a medical error, but, but thanks for doing it. But, but I'm going to just go around, maybe starting with you, Tom. Yeah. You're running a very successful hospital in terms of patient safety. What do you, before, we have about 10 minutes left. A couple of minutes, what do you tell everybody what should they be doing that you're doing right that they should be following? Yeah, no, I think it's I think a couple of things. You have to look at you have to look at your organizational culture and where your potential problem spots are. Number two is you got to th think about how we can make this better and who you're going to engage to make it better and leverage the technology wherever you can. But I also think is you you've got to begin to start to think out of the box a little bit more and in the sense of. And, I'll, and I, I know I kind of hinted at it in the last question about how we look at our community. That 30 year age gap, that's our problem. And that's what I tell our organization. We just can't say, well, that's a political problem. That's a historical problem in Chicago. We have to own the problem and own our communities. If you ask me a positive out of COVID, and there's probably very little positive out of COVID, was a lot of academic medical centers began to look at their communities very differently. It opened up a door that says our communities are important. It's not just getting the sickest people from over the country, across the country to come in for this really high tech care. It's how are we gonna take the people that live next door, take care of them. And, and I think we've really begun to develop that. But I, I do believe that the hospital, we've gotta be safe within our walls, but we also have to think about our community and how we're gonna improve the health of our community. Because, and I think that we can make those kind of investments. I also believe that if we're waiting for political solutions, we're gonna wait a long time. <laughs> I think as, as healthcare providers and big ones, I think we do owe it to our community to begin to think differently about how we're gonna improve health across our community. Thank you, thank you so much, Tom. Chad. Well, I agree with all that. I, you mentioned COVID, and actually I have some, several colleagues in the room that were so instrumental in our incredible work through COVID. Dr. Wilson is here. Dr. Afsar, Dr. Stamos, uh, what worked well for us in COVID? We talk about a lot. 
because we came out stronger than we went in, which is kind of unimaginable given, yes, we were tired and worn out, but um, how did we do that? We talk about what happened. Well, we were singularly focused. This is your point. We were singularly focused. Perhaps the nation was, but I can tell you UCI Health was singularly focused on every one of those patients. And the next one that came in the door, what did we learn from the one before? And how can we take that? Because we are all writing the new evidence base on the fly, right? Um, and how do we do that? What we thought was going to be six months maybe turned into, right, incredible duration. So learning and doing that, I mean, I think we have a, an incredible responsibility as academic and teaching organizations to train the next generation. It's not just in the School of Medicine, which absolutely, Dean Stamos is here, but we train so many others, right? So what are we doing to make sure that we're arming these new trainees with these tools, the skill set, this mindset, and the safety idea very differently than maybe we have done ever before. I think that's something we're spending a lot of time on. I think that's a commitment from all of us. The last thing I'll say is, and Marcus, I agree with you, uh, I think we should all be looking at every board, either we get to serve on or that we get to work with, how are we spending our time? This is an easy calculation, yeah. right? We do it every year. We look back and say, how much time are we spending on finances versus this, versus this, versus this, right? Um, and guess what? We then reshape our agendas going forward because we feel like if we're not directing enough to this space. It's a little reactive, of course, but it's our commitment to refresh that But the results annually. show. Right. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Kim, last but not least. Um, I agree with my colleagues and what they're saying. I, I think one thing we haven't touched on and is more in the heads up kind of category. Um, well, I'll start by another good thing that came out of COVID and it's hard to find them, but I think we as an industry became more vulnerable and we became more collaborative. And I hope that that will stay with us because I think it's serving all, all of our patients and our communities uh, better than before. Um, but I think we have a responsibility to, to be held accountable for all of this. And it's appalling to me how many leaders there are in healthcare that are comfortable with we did the best we could with what we had. You know, we don't know what's going to come through the ER and all the all the things that are really challenging for us to manage. But at the end of the day, it, we are the people that are responsible for it. So that heads up would be to think about what's coming down the pike next. And I think our society, and you touched on it earlier today, has changed. Um, and this whole idea of psychological safety is so important to this culture that we're all building and, and striving for. Um, but the people who come through our doors are going through a lot. And your stories, of, of, and we hear all the time. Um, so I think being more in tune to the mindset of the, the community and the patients we're serving and better equipping our staff so that we can be more proactive in seeing what's coming around the corner to me is one of the next big challenges in all of this and I, I it's, it's there's no perfect solution to it but um, our communities have changed and we need to understand that and do more for our staff so they're able to ensure patient safety I always like to think about having a patient go home even safer than they were before they came in our doors. And that does have something to do about what happened within our four walls, so to speak, but has a heck of a lot to do with what's happening to them at, at home. Thank you. John, if, if you allow me one yeah, additional aspect, um, which we haven't talked about today, but which I think we can't get to zero harm if we don't address health inequities. Um, when you look at the numbers, right, and that's what we do at ECRI, we look at the numbers, you have a 20 to 30 percent higher chance of having a negative adverse event if you're a person of color, if you're female. You, you mentioned maternal health. You know, Chicago is certainly uh, still very segregated, dare, dare I say, when, when you think about it. Um, and, and if we don't really take a crack at health inequities, and there are multitude, right? There are socioeconomic, there are rural versus urban, there are people of color, LGBTQ, uh, disabilities. We won't, we won't be able to get to zero harm because that drives a lot of the harm. And that, again, is the board responsibilities. And it's not enough to have diversity sitting on the board. 
it's about on how do you deal and, and you, I, I really loved what you said, is we have a 60% um, diversity in our community and we have 60% diversity in our staff. That's a first step. That's a first step. Do you speak the language? Do you understand the cultural differences? Do you understand the, the religious differences? Um, that needs to be at the forefront. We all have implicit biases. I don't think for a moment anybody goes to work in healthcare and says, I'm going to treat somebody different today but we all have our implicit um, biases. If we don't work on them, if we don't uh, make them obvious, uh, more visible, and then can do something about it, we will continue to treat people differently. And that is a board responsibility to make sure that their leaders taken that on. So I just had to throw that in there Thank because you. I Thank think that's really that. important. Huh? Yeah, I want to follow up on what Mark has said. You know, our, talking about our board, so we have about, 60 community health workers who follow up on our patients in the community afterwards, especially in, in the OB world, to make sure postpartum there aren't any issues. That's where our board really stepped in. We have Those were mostly funded by philanthropy. They said, well, what do you need? We need people to follow up with our patients in the community. So our board, realizing that there were quite the equity issues, needed help, and you've got to have those kind of, and those people come from the community. We hire local folks. They have to have a high school education, we train them, but they know the people in the neighborhood, they're comfortable, they go out and visit, they can speak the language, and it's made a huge difference in terms of you know, our readmission rates, but also the level of care that people are getting in the community, because there can be immediate follow-up if someone's starting to decline. And I know it's one of the great things you've done, Tom. Again, nothing happens accidentally. It's been, you have been deliberately trying to bring people that represent your community into your hospital's care providers so that they can have empathy and maybe more understanding of what's going on. It's well, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, the thing, the thing I say, I, I know my team would hear this, is, is, okay, so there's a lot of inequity in America and there are some things around rural health care and other things that are really hard to solve. Our, our underserved neighborhoods are 20 minutes from one of the, a beautiful downtown. It seems to me this is a solvable problem. Right. This is not like I, we've got to go 300 miles. We have to, to go recruit. two miles and we have to kind right. of take that on. Yeah. And there's 600,000 people in the south side of Chicago. It's a big population, but it's one for a lot of reasons over the last hundred years has been underserved. This, but this is fixable. I, I, I firmly believe that this is not insolvable and we just have to tackle it as a healthcare organization. Well, well, that's the point. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I know we're out of time, right. but I just want to say, number one, put patient safety on the board's right. agenda. Uh, number two, look at things holistically, technology that can help like remote monitoring, EMR, to dealing with the community health issues. Number three, just repeating the same thing you know to do over and over again and that culture that you, that you talk about that's just so important. And I think, Kim, uh, having the, the forethought of bringing the right people on your board and the right type of clinician so that patient safety is at the, at the focus of every meeting. So either before the financials or right after the financials, we talk <laughs> about patient safety. So thank you so much. What a great group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.